to thank you all for coming on um, such a wintry day already. Um, is actually is today technically the first day? No. No. no? no. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it's only November. <laughs> Um, and I know we're, for those of you who just came in, I, I can see a few more chairs are going to be set up. My name is Ann Helmreich, and I'm the director of the Baker North Center for the Humanities. And thank you very much for coming. And I also want to recognize Joanne Hustis, um, the dr director of the library, um, because this is a joint collaborative venture between the Baker North Center and the library. And I want to thank so many colleagues from the library for coming over. And if you've never been here before, um, you're always welcome. For those of you um, joining us, there's cookies and drinks and snacks floating around. Um, today is part of a series of lectures, as I mentioned, that we've co-hosted, and the purpose behind these is to explore the developing concept of the digital humanities and how media and technologies that often reside in libraries can actually help support and innovate humanities scholarship. And when um, Joanne and, and, and I should also thank Tim as well, we're developing our dream list of speakers, Dan Cohen's name rose right up to the top. Um, which will, it's for a number of reasons, which I'll elaborate on as a way of introduction. Um, Dan is associate professor at the Department of History and Art History at George Mason University and director of the Center for History and New Media. And he's also the author of Zotero, which is a bibliographic tool that, as my colleague in the humanities said, told Laura, I hope you don't mind if I quote you, has changed my life. <laughs> Um, and I'm particularly excited about this tool, not just for its capacity to organize data, but how it evolved. Because Dan is a scholar, you earned your BA in religion from Princeton, your MA in the history of religion, and a PhD in history. And the Zotero tool came out of, I heard you give a talk at ACL, it's about solving real life problems of scholarship. Um, and secondly, Dan bridges the world between digital humanities and what I will call, for want of a better word, traditional scholarship in a way that reminds us that, in fact, this probably isn't a gap or a divide, but is one and the same thing. In 2007, his book, Equations from God, Pure Mathematics and Victorian Faith, was published by Johns Hopkins University Press. And in 2005, he published with Ro Roy Rosenzweig, um, Digital History, A Guide to Gathering, Preserving, and Presenting the Past on the Web. And this was published with the University of Pennsylvania Press. Um, and he's exploring the relationship between theory and practice in your new book, right, concerning digital scholarship. Um, I heard Dan, as I mentioned, speak in conjunction with his receipt of the inaugural fellowship um, given by the American Council of Learned Societies for Digital Inno Innovation. And I will say, in all honesty, I turn absolutely pea green with envy when I read your list of grants, um, which we were just talking over lunch, whether we should let our administrators in the Delbert Hall know about this, or whether um, if we, in fact, um, talk about this too much, it'll create a burden of, on us of <laughs> why don't we do the same thing? Um, but his grants include a $7 million grant from the National History Education Clearinghouse, um, you received grants from the National Endowment for the Humanities um, for uh, 2004, I'm being so crass. My grandmother would be appalled. I'm seeing up your name in dollar amounts. But I'm just so impressed. $240,000 um, <laughs> please don't ever tell her. <laughs> um, for a project regarding enhancing historical research with text mining and analysis tool. Um, and three grants which total up to over a million in support of Zotero. So um, I think those of you who know how hard it is to get grants in the humanities can appreciate what a testament to both Dan's innovative um, scholarship and his hard work this means. It's a remarkable record of success as represented by grants, fellowships, and publications. And I'm so delighted that Dan could join us today and that you could be here as well. Please join me in welcoming Dan Cohen. Uh, well, thank you very much, Anne, for that generous introduction. Um, I feel after all the talk about um, changing your life and the talk about cash that you probably think you've come to a different talk than the one I'm about to give on digital scholarship. Um, uh, but uh, well, hopefully I will change your life with this uh, discussion of digital history. Um, I also, since you know it's a small enough group, uh, you, know, you should all feel free to just stop me at any time, raise your hand, uh, call out. I'm happy to field questions as I go along. Um, what I want to talk today uh, about is, uh, and it is very much the, the sort of origin of Zotero, which I'll talk about as, as part of this. Um, you know, what I feel is the, the kind of main challenge that historians face, and I think actually more broadly uh, scholars in the humanities face, or really all of us face, 
in this age. Um, and, and I think there are some ages where the humanities have been challenged by uh, new modes of analysis, schools of thought, um, Freudian analysis, or new subjects that cast light on the past, for instance, um, decades of work on the role of gender or race. Um, but, but I think we're now in an age, uh, and over lunch I was talking about this, as, as it's been sort of rather obvious to me, but maybe it hasn't been to, to a lot of other humanists, is that um, you know, the main challenge is, is something that uh, my, my friend and colleague Roy Rosenzweig called abundance. That um, Roy had this terrific article in the American Historical Review in which he, he sort of suggested that there are two possible futures for history. One in which he called the sort of scarce future, in which we lose a lot of the historical record because digital things are fragile. We lose them. Um, we lose them in various ways. Um, magnetic problems, um, password problems, all kinds of ways that we can lose the historical record. And he, he sort of worried that one possible future in 50 or 100 years would be that we have very little to go on. Um, and the other possible future was what he called a, a future of abundance, where we had so much to look at, so much has been digitized, so much has been saved, so much is available to the historian and the humanities scholar that they, they simply just don't know what to do with it. And um, at some point, the, the, the quantity becomes a kind of qualitative problem that, that um, you know, we begin to worry about how we actually do research. And so um, you know, I think the obvious example of this that, that I always use, is, since it's what most people come across um, who aren't familiar with the digital humanities, is Google's book search. Um, you know, they've now digitized, by all accounts, over 7 million books. That's going up into around 15 million in the next three, three years or so. You know, digitizing 3,000 books a day um, at the University of Michigan. So um, you know, just the scale of abundance, we're, we're just not used to this. Um, you know, it's not just Google Books. There's the Open Content Alliance, which is the, the kind of American-born uh, competitor to Google Books, has over a million texts that have been digitized. Uh, over lunch, we were talking about a new European library launched yesterday, actually with two million volumes. Um, but of course, it's not just books. Uh, it's all kinds of media. The National Endowment for the Humanities has funded over 30 million uh, pages of historical newspapers. I'm sure if you logged in through your library portal, you can access ProQuest uh, historical newspapers. Um, JSTOR has over a million articles going back to uh, the early 20th century. Um, and then if you're interested in art, of course, ArtStore uh, this year surpassed a million art objects that are online and available. And that's, of course, just the tip of the iceberg that we could talk about. And I, so my feeling has been for the last decade that um, at, at some point, this really has to make us question our practice. Um, you know, not only our practice, but also our theory of how we go about um, history. And I can take an example just from my own work on, you know, again, I'm a traditionally trained historian. I did archival research in Great Britain for uh, my book on, on Victorian mathematics. Um, you can run out. It's a bestseller. Um, <laughs> so many people are interested in Victorian mathematics. Um, and, uh, and so, um, but, you know, a very traditional monograph of that uh, any historian would have done over the last century. Um, but, but like most monographs, and indeed mo like still, like probably 90 to 95% of the research that goes on, surprisingly, in 2008, um, you know, one has to question the methodology of that kind of a work, where uh, the evidence is really, could be questioned as being anecdotal, where you have the standard, you know, the graduate student who's writing the dissertation and comes up with three good examples from three books they found in the library. Well, when you have Google Books at your fingertips, you can, in an instant, find 10 more, 100 more, 1,000 more? How do you choose which ones to go with? Um, you can find counterexamples far more easily. And so what does it mean to sort of prove proven something in history? And I think that's a problem that has vexed me for a while and indeed is, is um, informing my, my latest uh, book that I'm working on, on the theory and practice of digital scholarship. Uh, so we really, I think, do, we are at a moment where this is the greatest challenge, the, the challenge of abundance. And, now, of course, there are other fields that have been dealing with this question for a while that we could look to. And, and obviously, um, I think we have some IT and, and computer science people here and people in the sciences who have been dealing with abundance for a while. And so, you know, for instance, for um, 
for things like books and, uh, and, and documents that are text scannable, um, you know, there's a whole field that's been around for quite some time um, that does what's called text mining. You've probably heard of data mining. Um, and uh, there are whole, you know, uh, even sub-disciplines within uh, this, this area of computer science. And um, you, know, you can take large masses of documents, you can apply algorithms to it, and you can spit something out the other side that should tell you something. Um, well, this sounds great. And indeed, uh, one, of, one of our NEH grants is just to explore the potential of text mining for history and historians, because we're, we haven't used this. And, and part of the problem that we begin with with that, that project is I just don't feel that we're prepared for this world. Um, we're just not prepared. We're not prepared in, in quite a few ways. I mean, some of them are, are pretty obvious. Uh, I mean, we just don't have the technical know-how that, for instance, the physicists had when um, you know, the web comes out of CERN and out of uh, nuclear physics. And they're, it's just they're fluid in, in that realm. And it's been hard to do first physics uh, and now increasingly biology. Most biology has become very IT intensive. And so, those people who are coming up through graduate programs just you know, know the tools, have the technical know-how. Historians don't. Uh, and that, that's a huge problem. Um, second, a second problem that we run into is that we don't have what I think Cliff Lynch has, has very helpfully called the computational access to the materials we want to look at. So Google provides one kind of access. It provides a, a kind of access that at 3 in the morning in your pajamas, you can get up and say, I really want to look at a Victorian mathematics book. And you can go and do that and, and, and leaf through it as if you got it out of the library. Well, that's great. But that doesn't allow the kinds of digital scholarship that I think we're going to have to do over the next decade. And that requires a computational access that, for instance, the Open Content Alliance, by making their entire corpus publicly available, downloadable, processable, uh, allows. So we just don't have access to what scientists have called data sets. Um, and indeed, the humanities collections will suffer further because a lot of scientific data is created with an end format in mind that can be processed in a certain way. So solar observatories produce data in a way that people already know how to subject algorithms to. Books are incredibly complicated. I mean, it's, they're an old technology, and they're much more complicated than people think. I mean, they do have structure, but it's very hard to pull that structure out through automated methods. They have things like diagrams that are very hard to deal with. Um, and they have metadata issues as well. If you've ever gone through Google Books, you can see that they have tremendous um, problems that librarians could help them out with. So, um, so we have those kind of very obvious problems uh, facing us in, in an age of abundance. Uh, but I think we have another kind of less obvious problem, and that is that we, I think, at least in history, we have been stung in the past by technological uses, and indeed by a, a relatively brief phase of quantitative history in the, in the late 60s and 70s. And um, uh, it wasn't a good experience, I think, for a lot of historians. When, when the first mainframes came online, historians said, oh, we can you know, put census data in there and do these sorts of things. And as Roy always liked to point out, the, the output from that brief age, uh, when you look back at it, it, I mean, it is really laughable. I mean, there are entire dissertations that, for instance, study things like um, the development of New York City. And the, the conclusion after many hours on the mainframe or months on the mainframe of computation and many hours of, of writing is that you know, the development of New York followed the uh, subway lines and their extension up the island of Manhattan, you know, which is sort of a rather obvious problem that pretty much any you know, freshman could tell you. Um, uh, but you know, so, so, and this is a problem that, that I have come to call um, uh, Oh, actually, let me um, uh, here. I'll, I'll give you give you one more more, more example here, which is a, a really nice example that I like to, to bring out. Um, and so this is uh, so the, here are the computer scientists at work on our stuff. So I, I have a past in history of religion. Um, here is the IBM Many Eyes um, project. How many people have gone to their website? 
OK, a few people. OK, so, and, and they were so delighted when they launched this project at IBM. They said, we've done this incredibly new analysis of the Bible. We've done text mining on it. And then we visualized the whole thing in a way. Um, and what they did was they, the, the size of the circles, this might be hard for people to see in the back, um, are the, the number of times a character or a figure in the Bible has been mentioned. And, um, and then there's these weird just lines interconnecting all of them, which are um, scenes that they appear in together. And, and so they came out with this and, and you know, it was trumpeted in the New York Times. And, and my basic point on it is um, you know, in the middle, there's a very large circle. And next to it, it says Jesus. And so this tells us that Jesus was important in the Bible, um, which again is a kind of rather uninteresting first year um, conclusion. right? And so how, how has this helped us? How has this given us something new? And I really think the onus is on those of us in the digital humanities to show how these computational methods can show us something new, can do something that scholars have always done, which is to expose things about the past that we didn't understand before. Um, and we, we really have this problem. Um, my, one of my most read blog posts on my blog uh, is called The Russia Problem. And this was the name I gave to this kind of a thing. And the, so The Russia Problem is, uh, it comes from a pretty good joke by, um, by uh, 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 Woody Allen back when he was relatively funny and a stand-up comedian. <laughs> and, um, and, uh, and I'm not going to do it justice, but the joke goes something like this. Um, I went to a speed reading class today. And it was just incredible. And when I finished, I sat down and read all of War and Peace in 20 minutes. It's about Russia. <laughs> um, so, and, and this is when you, when you look at the output, I think, on a lot. And again, this is an attempt, attempt at self-criticism of those of us in the digital humanities. You have a lot of Russia problems with the outputs if you look at some of what we produce. And so I can understand why a lot of historians, traditional or analog historians, as we sometimes call them, um, <laughs> in a relatively disparaging way. Um, uh, so you know, these are, these are um, you know, problems that I think we need to, to think more about. And indeed, that is what at the Center for History and New Media right now I think we're really interested in looking at. So looking at new modes, um, thinking about how we might do uh, scholarship in a digital age, in, in an age of abundance. Um, and you know, I think one of my initial conclusions on this is that we might have very different needs than, for instance, the math PhDs at Google, who have you know, a certain reason for wanting to scan through books. They have certain methodologies, but that might not really tell us a lot. Right? Um, you know, for instance, historians don't really care about ranking things as much as the Googlers care about ranking things, right? So it wouldn't really tell us much to say, you know, to look at Google Books. Indeed, how do they produce a result set out of Google Books? What comes first, right? That's a confusing question to me. I'm sure they've got lots of math PhDs working on that. But I don't think they have a clear, a clear sense of where they're going to go with it. So I think we might have different needs. And, and what I want to talk about today is some of the ways that we can approach those needs. And some of it is actually in the act of theory. Some of it is in the act of, of um, creating new tools. We talked about this a little bit over lunch and the need to create new tools. Um, and, and also to think about the kinds of techniques that are applicable in history and the humanities. So it may be, for instance, that we are more interested in text mining techniques that don't end up with this, but that, for instance, provide um, what computer scientists call document classification. So um, another classic example of abundance that I like to, to trot out is um, about the poor presidential historian who uh, is working on history of the uh, Bill Clinton's White House, eight years in the White House. Um, and you can compare the work of that presidential historian or what he faces or she faces with, um, let's say, uh, Robert Caro and his work on uh, the Johnson administration. Right? So Bob Caro faced a manageable abundance. It was still a lot, right? tens of thousands of memos, letters, these sorts of things from the Johnson archives. Right? So let's say 40,000 of those. That's a doable project. It might take you eight or 10 years. But you can go to the National Archives and, and read pretty much everything. And that's what we're told to do in graduate school as historians, is you, gotta, you need to read everything before you put pen to paper. Um, well, you know, Bill Clinton's White House, you look at the historic, historical record from that, and you've got uh, just on their one uh, main email server, right, which is the modern equivalent of the memo, there's 40 million emails. Right? So 40 million emails, you can, you know, if you've got an envelope, you can pull out a pencil and do the back of the envelope calculation. 
you know, you read one email a minute without sleeping, drink a lot of coffee, and it's still 76 years, right? So, um, you know, uh, maybe if I was at a, a, a better endowed place than George Mason, I could hire a lot of assistants and, and do the, uh, the, the sort of landed gentry history of the Victorian age that way. But, but it's, it, it becomes impossible. So we might need things like document classification, which would say if we found a specific email, to say, hey, can you show me more like this? You, computational system, can you show me more documents like this? Because even things like keyword search are incredibly troubling. Um, try doing a keyword search on Al Qaeda from emails from the 90s. You know how many variants of the spelling that there are on that? And then how many figures? Al Qaeda might not even be mentioned in, a, in a, an email, but you might want to look at that. So, how do we find documents of interest? So we may have different needs than the computer scientists. And those needs might very well, and indeed I'm increasingly convinced, marry traditional modes of research that we've, we've always used in history and the humanities, that is close reading, um, with some of these techniques to find, to find documents that we want to read, simply because we need to rely on the computer. We're already relying on the computer to find us things to do research on. Um, so, um, you know, as we, we think about this, um, uh, just to bring up some more examples. I mean, here's a, a specific example, the um, uh, documenting the American South. Some of you may have used this. So here's a, a massive collection based at, at UNC. And, and indeed, the Southern Historical Collection um, based at, at Chapel Hill, um, which has 16 million documents from 2,500 family collections, plantations, et cetera. So this is a collection that almost every historian of the American South, particularly the antebellum South, has done research on. And they are in the process now of, of thinking about moving online. They're, they've digitized some things. They're looking at a, you know, possibly a multi-decade effort to get this stuff digitized. But we have all this tremendous baggage um, from the past. So you, know, you click on one of the tabs on the site, and it pulls up the um, uh, small font here. But um, these are the Library of Congress subject headings. And this is just a very small snip. It's just one screenshot of you know, slavery. Um, you know, and how, do, how does this LLC subject heading help us um, with, with a collection of 16 million documents? It, it doesn't do a lot. And, and how does, does anyone even use LC subject headings <laughs> anymore? Um, so you know, I think the collection has sensed that. And indeed, they do have a Google custom search. Um, but because of the algorithms that are going on behind the scenes at Google, the search is terrible. Because how can it tell, really, what you're looking for? I mean, just a search on slavery. It's bringing up Booker T. Washington's autobiography. Um, you know, just a, 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 a smattering. I mean, I have no idea how these things you know, that were decided on by the mathematics that go into that search. So um, I do think we need to get involved with these questions. They're not normally questions that um, humanities scholars have, have been engaged with, for instance, the algorithms behind search engines, not something we're trained to think about. And yet, we're relying on these things to do our research. And so I think it's, it's really um, put upon us to, to become involved with it. Now, um, Documenting American Self has thought about this question of uh, more like this. So they actually, you can use the uh, uh, related colon um, uh, search uh, term. Um, to give you related things, but again, a very lousy result. Um, so I think more and more libraries are going to have to explore ways in which they become active participants in the research process. They're going to help you more with this abundance, managing abundance, and telling you in a more active sense rather than you leafing through folios, which is you know, what I was trained to do. That's just not going to cut it in an age where you have 40 million uh, emails from the Clinton White House. Um, I'm really fascinated when I come across new interfaces. I think it's really important to think about user interfaces into research collections and trying to think about ways in which those can be altered. Um, here's, I think, a good example of this that uses text mining. This is the uh, Time Magazine corpus uh, at BYU. Um, and what this allows you to do, I mean, this has really been set up for linguists, but I think it's fascinating for history, actually. Um, and, this, and so it's 100 million words from 1923 to 2006. It's all the articles from Time Magazine. Um, they've been digitized. They've been OCR'd, so transcribed into um, machine-readable text. And um, now here's an interface that's completely different than probably ones you've seen before, where you, I've done a search for race relations, the phrase race relations. And um, 
it has given me uh, several things. Um, it's given me a ref refinement panel. It's given me a bar graph of the occurrence of that term by decade. And did you can drill down in that. And then I think most interestingly, again, combining close reading and what Franco Moretti has called distant reading, which I think is a good term for it. So here's our distant reading portion of the screen. But you can easily go from, for instance, this is the 1960s, and see what's called, what computer scientists called Kiwik, uh, keyword in context. So you can see your keywords in the context they're in. So you can quickly scan through and say, oh, yeah, that might be an article I want. You can click on it and pull up the article. So it's a really interesting interface. Um, well, you know, it, this does have a bit of a Russia problem in that uh, it gives us almost a, a perfect bell curve, you wouldn't imagine, around the 1960s and the civil rights era. There is an anomaly, which I think in my book will become a very serious topic of study, the anomaly. There's, you can rely on patterns in distant reading, but you can also see, look for anomalies. This one actually has an interesting anomaly, the 1990s, which we probably know why that is, but someone in 100 or 200 years wouldn't. Um, any guesses? Yes, O.J. Simpson, all right, first guess. God, this is a sharp audience, okay, um, terrific. Uh, never had anyone get that on the first guess. Okay, yes, so um, that's terrific. Um, yeah, so OJ, the O.J. Simpson and, and, the, and the aftermath of that. Um, so you can imagine other kinds of interfaces into historical collection other than just you know, box, folio kinds of archive collections or your standard OPAC, your standard online catalog that a library would have. Um, some further thought experiments um, that I've done is just thinking about um, uh, the, uh, this is one of our collections, probably the collection we're best known for, the September 11th Digital Archive, which is a project we did with the City University of New York. And what this did was it, it made the assumption that if we want to save history, we have to be proactive about it because no one's going to have their emails in 50 or 100 years, the equivalent of um, the diary entries on 9-11. And all the digital photographs will, will go the way of the dodo because the formats will change and all that stuff. So we took an active stance on this and set up a website where people could come and contribute. We ended up partnering with the Smithsonian. The Library of Congress ended up accessioning the 9-11 archive as their first major digital, digital acquisition. It's a collection we're incredibly proud about. And it, it ended up collecting 150,000 digital objects from about 30,000 people worldwide. And it's a really interesting collection, not just to browse through, but I think also for research purposes. So um, you know, I think here's a case where um, just, again, re-envisioning the, the, the moment of research and also the nature of the, the library and the archive. So of course, when we started out on this, we had no idea what we were doing. Um, and and uh, you know, so we started out, we had a basic browse interface. Right? This is very standard with online collections where, again, the analog being the pulling the box off the shelf, the leafing through a set of photographs, let's say, in an art museum. Um, but uh, for the, I can't remember how many years ago I, I did this, but you can also think about what I've been calling three, the three-dimensionalization of the archive. So we can not only view the archive as a set of flat documents, but we can extract slices of it and combine it with other research that we're doing. So here's a basic um, experiment here where I've taken, um, I have access, direct access to the 9-11 uh, database. And um, I've gone ahead and extracted all the stories that happen and photographs that were at least claimed to happen right at 9 AM on 9-11, right? So this is um, mere minutes after the initial events. Um, and I've extracted those. And with a little bit of uh, a programming, I've sent the, the stories out to be geolocated uh, through a service that Yahoo runs that will, will geocode materials you send to them. And so that has helped me place it. And then I brought that back and put it on a Google map. Don't, don't ask me why I didn't use Yahoo Maps. But, but um, it's allowed me to place all these things. So this is something that would have taken you know, so this is just a couple hours of programming and mucking about. Um, but this would have taken a long time to find stories, to figure out, oh yeah, they were at the corner of that street and that street, put a pin in the map, figure these things out. Um, and suddenly this allows us, and we have photographs in here as well, um, based on their metadata, um, to really get a new view of an archive. And so this would be another form of, again, thought experiment of the kinds of research interfaces you might want in an age of abundance, where you might say, well, I'm really looking for, let's say, a cluster of stories or events or photographs from, from this area. Another thought experiment, um, and maybe, if, actually, do I have an Ethernet uh, connection or any wireless connection? 
Probably not. OK, won't you? OK, because I can do some fun things with a live map of this. Um, well, let me, let me just explain this, and then we'll, we'll see if, uh, if we can get that going. Um, so uh, here's another example where, this time using Google Earth, uh, where I have extracted, again, um, slices of the database based on particular queries. Um, in this case, um, this is somewhat meant to be humorous, but I guess might not be. But I've taken compared CNN viewers. So these are the blue dots are the uh, people who are watching CNN at the time, okay, on uh, on that morning, and then um, people who said that they prayed that day. Okay, so I've used text mining techniques to extract those things. The red are the prayer, and this is where it would be helpful to actually go to the live version. So maybe maybe if we can do that. Uh, so, so here's how many people have used Google Earth or use it? Okay, so, um, you know, again, this is, you know, we could do this in, in GIS, which is the, the fancier system, but, um, I, you know, I'm an advocate of using tools that work, that you can do stuff on them quickly. Um, okay, so here we'll, we'll fly in a little bit. So here are the, the blue dots, which are the CNN viewers. Okay. And, um, uh, you know, Obvious population centers, things like that. Let me um, let me go ahead and actually pull these off for just a second. Or actually, I'll leave them on. Oh, actually, let's do this first. Uh, so here's Fox News viewers. Um, so, so this is rather interesting. Um, now, it's not. Uh, let me just give you a fuller screen here. Um, so, so Fox News was actually relatively new in 2001. Uh, it was on uh, far fewer cable systems, so the, the, the potential audience was far, far fewer, even though it now has a larger audience than CNN. Um, but what you notice immediately is you have this whole axis here on the East Coast that there's not a single uh, Fox News um, viewer. And, and actually, I mean, as you go west, you realize already in 2001 it was a very rural news channel. It, it, the, the demographics of Fox News, even this early on, are actually rather striking. I mean, look at the, again, population centers in Houston, and then there's nothing out here except Fox News viewers. Um, so we don't have a great data set here. Um, we're only dealing with maybe 20,000 stories, but you could scale up. Um, but still, at 20,000 stories, you get a lot. And again, if you think about this kind of collection, we've got 20,000 stories of what people did on 9-11. So these are people who said Fox News with the yellow. Um, and you can compare that with traditional historical research where, for instance, the Columbia Oral History Project, which is the sort of gold standard of, of oral history in this country. And you know, they did 300 interviews. Now, I'm sure those interviews are far better than what we've got in our collection, right? But there's, there is an interesting point here where when you hit a certain level of quantity, you can do things that you couldn't do with the 300 stories. You couldn't do this with it, for sure. Okay? So here's one of the quick prospecting things that we can do that you know, there's one guy in North Dakota who's got his dish, his dish up. Um, so, um, so here's a CNN Fox News um, comparison. Let's let's go into the, the question of thinking about religiosity. If you were a historian of religion um, and wanted to see uh, where you know the prayer belt is, um, you know, we could flip on these prayer stories. And I think what's incredibly striking is here. We'll just go down into Texas a little bit. Um, is that what you get almost uniformly across the country is a suburban and exurban ring. Um, and, and in fact, when you contrast it with the CNN viewers, it is actually rather interesting. Um, so you know, the godless CNN viewers are in, are in, the, um, are, are in the city core. So, here, so you can see that in Dallas. Let's, uh, let's scroll over here. Um, you know, uh, Atlanta, a um, little bit more mixed, but as you go up the coast uh, toward where I live, um, so we'll, we'll zoom in a little bit more into Washington. Um, and what's incredible is, you know, again, you've got a, a sort of ring around the cities. Um, I live here in Silver Spring, actually. You can see the godless country of Montgomery County um, in Maryland. Um, and can, you can contrast that with a large number of red dots in, in northern Virginia. And you can overlay this with other demographic information if we wanted, right? We could, we could overlay church membership roles. We could do all kinds of things. Again, does this tell us a tremendous amount? Perhaps not. But I think it gives you a sense of the kinds of things we could do once we have our information in a format that we can start um, uh, using digital methods on top of. Here, we'll go up the, the coast a bit. Um, So again, um, New York. OK. Um, go back to 
Okay. So um, again, I think it's time for us to do, do these kinds of experiments. I think now's the time to kind of suss out what techniques we, we might use. Um, I've also been feeling, as I've been doing this work for the past decade, that um, you know, there's things you can do with, with sort of big servers and giant repositories and fancy tools. But, um, and, and those work well on, abundant, uh, on, on the question of abundance. But um, over the past five years, I've increasingly felt that there's, uh, we've, we've sort of overlooked um, the power of something much smaller than, than these things. And that is the, the power that has been invested in personal collections and the human assessment that goes along with it. And the thought experiment I like to do on this is just to think about the Library of Congress. And, and just sticking with dissertations for a second, we could do the whole 132 million objects uh, Library of Congress, but I think this is a good thought experiment on this to, to think about what's, what's held here. So you've got a million dissertations, and again, what I want to think about is what went into that and how much is actually in the paper that sits in the Library of Congress. So you can do your, your quick back of the envelope, average time to write dissertations, four years. Um, it's about 2,000 work hours in a year, 40 hours times 50 weeks. Um, I always like to discount uh, <laughs> grad student. That's my estimate of uh, 1,000 hours of coffee drinking. And, and a th so 1,000 hours of actual work right, on a dissertation for four years. You, you do the math, and you quickly get there's 4 billion hours of human asset, of someone sifting through things, of outlining, of creating bibliographies. Right? So what you get in the dissertations is, is merely the tip of the iceberg, or the manuscript, or the book. right? That's merely the tip of the iceberg. And we've lost all this other stuff. And I thought back to my own you know, experience in graduate school, and, and everyone's had this experience, that um, whatever field you're in, oftentimes the most important things are when you, you know, you're, you're just starting to think in a field, and you want to know well, what's important to look at, and where do I go? And your dissertation director kind of leans over in a whispered voice and says, these 10 books are really important, or that archive over there has a really interesting collection that you might want to leaf through. And, and that often, that stuff is sort of the folk wisdom of the academy. And it's never been captured digitally. Uh, and, and our feeling at the center was that we thought we could create a tool to start tackling these questions of digital research. And that also could start to get the personal collection and all the human assessment that's gone into it into a format whereby we could share it, we could aggregate it, we could make it usable in a way that it's not when the final product is something that's 100% paper. The result of this is, is Zotero. Um, so I always like to do a check. So how many people have heard of Zotero? OK, wow. OK, and how many people are Zoterons, active users of Zotero? <laughs> Right, OK, great. And one person, how many people have changed their lives? Um, OK, great. It's terrific. By, by the way, I have a free sticker for you uh, in, in my back. Um, maybe that'll be our new tagline, Zotero. It changed, it'll change your life. Um, so um, again, you know, uh, I think a lot of people, when they first hear about Zotero, think about it as a competitor to, let's say, EndNote or RoughWorks. But as you can see by, by what I've talked about before, I mean, really, it comes out of much larger interest that, that we've had and I've had at the Center for History and New Media about just how are we going to do research in a digital age, that we're not adequately prepared. We don't have the tools to do it. And we felt looking at something like EndNote, which has a 1990, you know, Windows 95 look still and doesn't do the kinds of things we want it to do and isn't flexible enough to ever do that kind of thing, that we needed to create something new. And um, in the conception of the tool, you know, this is what we were trying to get rid of, that, that there, we've got, as, as scholars, all these silos for our stuff. We've got handwritten notes. We've, a lot of us have Word documents. Um, some of us, although um, by a lot of reports a minority, use a digital tool already like an EndNote or RefWorks. And probably librarians in the room know how hard it is to kind of arm wrestle someone to use um, a digital tool like that sometimes. Um, and then we've got the web browser. And, and my feeling was more and more it's in that top left. We're doing more and more of our research there. Uh, and so how can we have all these other places that aren't integrated into the web browser? And that notion combined with the fact that uh, we were following the development of what was then Sunbird and then Phoenix and eventually came out as Firefox. And, and even before that, when it was 
uh, code as Netscape and then became Mozilla, and there's a whole history we could go into on that. But what, was, what we were following in the early part of this decade was that not only was this browser going to be open source, which meant we could get really into the guts of it. We could alter it. We could pick up data streams that are coming in and out of it. Um, not only that, but uh, it had a um, extensible architecture from the start. So it was set up to be extended with tools. And that really fascinated us. So this conception combined with the very nature of Firefox um, is the origin of the tool. For those few in the audience who, who don't know about it, I'll, I'll just do a quick tour here. So, um, so again, it installs as a Firefox extension uh, and, and um, gives you a, an interface that we very shamelessly and very deliberately cribbed from iTunes because we looked, at, we looked at the market. And if you look at the origin of digital tools, um, oftentimes they don't take cues from existing things. And we wanted to take, we didn't want to reinvent the wheel. And um, this sort of, um, actually there's a, a technical name for it, Miller columns, um, where you have, you go from the general to the specific in a set of columns, is a very common uh, user interface attribute. Um, and um, what's, what's neat about, again, following from our, our sort of technical investigation of what became Firefox, uh, we also wanted the tool to run offline as well as online, which was really critical as historians because we were convinced that not everything will be digitized um, necessarily. And so you need to be able to use the tool in an archive that doesn't have Wi-Fi. And so, um, um, so that, that's a problem with web applications like RefWorks that sit on a server in California. Well, if you don't have access to the web, you don't have access to your research collection. So what's unique about Zotero is that you can use it online or offline. When you're online, it takes on the attributes of a web application. It can interact with the web. But it's perfectly fine offline. Indeed, I was using it on the plane right in here. So um, I'll just quickly go through this since it seems like most of you know this. We can add notes. We can add attachments down here. Um, again, as part of this, we are trying to capture as much of the research and assessment process as possible, because we're going to use that later, as I'll discuss. Tagging is, is popular in this crazy Web 2.0 world we live in. This is basically just assigning keywords, um, non-professional keywords to things. And I think um, the tab that often gets neglected in Zotero, but that we very deliberately chose to highlight, is relating things. That we felt like tools like EndNote didn't do a good enough job. We felt as historians, often we say, we write a note about a set of things rather than just one thing. And so the, the, again, the, the offline analog of going from the note cards to systems like an EndNote where, or FileMaker, where, a lot, you know, where I started doing my research in FileMaker, where it's that sense of just a digital note card that you have a book and you write a note on that book. Well, what if you're writing a note about two books in an article, something like that? And when you bundle these things together, we can draw very interesting conclusions from that. Right? These are related in some way that might, we can inform other scholars later on, hey, if you're looking at that, you might want to look at this other thing up there. So we've captured a lot in these tabs. Um, we, of course, have uh, you know, digital versions of highlighter and post-it notes. And you've waited a long time to replace the HTTP with Zotero colon slash slash. But we can, of course, project stuff from Zotero onto the web. Uh, we can do this in a variety of ways. A lot of people don't realize that. So another great thing about Firefox extensions, you can drag something from your desktop into Zotero, and it'll drop into Zotero. You can drop something from Zotero into a web browser. So for instance, if you're writing a blog post, you can grab a bunch of articles and just drop them into a blog post, and Zotero will format it. So there's full drag and drop ability and full export import from the web. And of course, we've got um, integration with word processors. So I mean, this part of it is the basic part to have a viable research tool that people will adopt so that they can do a kind of soup to nuts research process from investigation, note taking, um, all the way through the writing process and publication. OK, but I think getting back to the theme of this talk, I mean, we think we've done a good job shoehorning a kind of top notch reference manager in the browser. But we have much bigger fish to fry than what EndNote and RefWorks are doing. We want to use the tool to enable new forms of research. Um, and we, we have in the project, I think, applied um, some new principles to the research process. So the first one, um, which is generally what grabs Z Zoterons and gets them to stay, is this sort of magic that computer scientists call semantic computing. And that is that we're, we're leveraging the fact that, um, that there is metadata. There's information about scholarly documents on the web that's often hidden that we can grab as part of the research process. 
So what's unique about Zotero is that when you're looking at a scholarly object, like an article at JSTOR, it realizes it's an article, and this is a little bit washed out here, but it will give you an icon in the address bar, and you just click on that to save it into your Zotero collection. And we use a variety of methods to do that. So we have an architecture that we call translators, you can, and you can write one yourself if you know a little bit of coding skills. Um, so uh, whereby we can identify scholarly objects in the web browser, and those can be anything from films to manuscripts and letters, uh, articles, books, book chapters, all these, all these things that you might want to save. We also have people actually using Zotero and customizing it for their various research needs. We have um, bioinformatics people who are customizing it to um, save uh, genomes into Zotero. We have an active community that uses Zotero as a recipe manager. Um, so they've created translators so that Zotero works on epicurious.com and other recipe sites. <laughs> And you click on it. Um, this is actually a rather interesting um, use. But you click on it, and it'll save the recipe. It'll tag it with the tags that users on Epicurious have given it. So it'll breakfast, lunch, dinner, drinks, these sorts of things. It will create a shopping list for you um, in the metadata fields. So, um, And one of the lessons here that we've, we've definitely learned from um, this project and, and from our other software projects is that you need to make any digital tool open and flexible enough that people can use it for their purposes because we don't know how they're going to use it. So if you, if you give them something that, that they can add to, they go ahead and do it. Um, OK, and so we've created these sensors, and they use a variety of methods. So um, one of the neat things about running a tool within the browser is that, uh, for instance, if we see an ISBN, a book number, on a page, we can actually have Zotero, since it lives in the web browser, send a message to, for instance, Amazon's web services to say, hey, we have this ISBN. Could you give us the author title and publication information? And Amazon will send that back to us, and we'll save that. We can use any variety of methods that we like since we live in this environment. We could communicate with software that's on your desktop. So we could communicate with Google Earth or other tools that people create. So it really becomes a portal into which we can use this semantic information to move material back and forth very fluidly. And I think what happens in this case is that you end up with a, 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 what I've been calling a fluidity of bibliography. And historians have always, uh, or at least for the past 50 years, have looked down upon bibliographers and, and the research of creating a bibliography. There's no creative work in it. Um, we forget that you know, I'm, a Victor I'm a historian of the Victorian age. There were, there were historians who made their name on, on bibliographic work. Um, who you know, catalog things in ways that were absolutely critical, essential for entire fields. And um, so uh, you know, we want to be able to allow people to grab stuff, collate it, arrange it, and then pass back that structured information in as many ways as possible to other researchers and to the web in general. What ends up happening when you think in this way is that you end up with a kind of virtuous circle. So here's a great example. Um, this is WorldCat, OCLC's WorldCat, big catalog, online catalog. And um, uh, without talking to us at all, they created something called WorldCat Lists, where you can get a uh, account on WorldCat. And then you can set up bibliographies or you know, books you might be interested on. They call them lists. Um, and so here's one by Viola12345 about Shakespeare and performance. It has uh, 46 books in it. Um, so good bibliography on this. Um, and you can go here. And what they did is, because they knew about Zotero, all they did was customize the output of this page to embed, in a hidden fashion, metadata about these works. So they used, and we have a variety of standards, international standards, other kinds of standards for, um, for exposing information to, uh, to the world and to Zotero. And as long as you use one of those things, we don't even have to write a translator. So Zotero, which is looking over your shoulder as you're surfing around, comes this page and sees, oh yeah, there are these Im embedded tags that have author title information. And it puts up the folder that you would see as a Zotero user for any other site. And so what's neat here is you can grab stuff off WorldCat lists. You can slide it back into another list. You can put it in a blog post. You can put it on Blackboard or Sakai. Things move around much more fluidly. Um, and I think you know, that, that could be considered just a getting rid of fiction pro friction process. But I think there's something much more to that as we get to the server. Um, I won't toot our horn too much 
more, but we've gotten lots of awards, like best free software awards and things like that. Okay, and we, and we have scale, which I think is the, the next point. So um, one of the interesting things here is that, um, again, with this fluidity of bibliography and with big numbers, so we have over a million users. Um, we have, because it's an open source project, we wrote Zotero with a customizable interface. So um, another important, uh, perhaps small, but I think important lesson is that you can, if you're writing a new tool, whether it's a web application or Firefox plugin, um, don't, you, don't hard code English words into your, into your site. And then what happens is people came along actually within months and started writing different uh, language interfaces for Zotero. We're now at 40, everything from Arabic to Vietnamese. We even have two forms of, of Norwegian, which I didn't even know there were two <laughs> forms of Norwegian. Um, we have Mongolian, Icelandic interfaces. Um, so this is the real power of, again, all we did is just put this out there, and it's really easy if you want to, if you speak a language that I don't know about, um, you can go and, and write, a, write a translation very easily, and it'll get pushed out to all the Zotero users. When we get the scale, um, I think you can start using another principle, which is social computing. And I've, I've never liked this term, uh, but you know, it sounds like laptops at tea time, like everyone's sitting around. Um, but, but, uh, but the idea with social computing is that, um, and, and there's other buzz, buzzwords, of course, like crowdsourcing and the, these sorts of things. But the idea in social computing is that when you reach a certain critical mass of users and you allow those users to interact in, in, a, in a frictionless way, that they can do things that individuals can't do. Um, so, you know, um, sharing, collaboration, these sorts of things are enabled. And again, since Zotero lives in the web browser rather than as a separate application, we can do lots of things. We've been running now for about eight months of the Zotero server. Uh, it's been in a more extended beta program than I expected, um, simply because we just, you know, you would not believe the um, technical requirements of a server that has to deal with this number of users who are synchronizing in real time with hundreds of objects. And you think about the potential once we release, do a full release on this, you know, again, average Zotero user has about 300 items in their collection times a million people. That's 300 million items that could get uh, passed back and forth through our, through our server. It starts to get to be a pretty thorny technical question. But um, we do have a lot of social aspects to the server. So we um, are going to have shared collections, notes, public domain documents. Um, we're going to do things like scholarly groups in macro and micro disciplines, um, official groups like the American Historical Association. So you could just look through a slice of our database and say, I just want to see books on the American Civil War that have been saved by uh, American Historical Association members who have opted to, to, to synchronize with the Zotero uh, server. Um, really interesting possibilities, going back to where I began, for recommendation systems, document classification, suggestions. Even at this early stage, it's really interesting to look at the search that we would get out of this. And you can imagine sending a student to search.zotero.org, where the result set is going to be, you know, rather than to google.com, um, you know, it could provide a single search box, so it's that simple. But we're going to spit out books, articles, blog posts, web pages, everything, right? Anything that you can save into, maybe recipes, um, will come out on, on that side. Um, so there's, I think, tremendous possibility for recommendation systems that we need to explore. Bibliographic feeds, um, people who use feed readers and so forth can pick up on this. Again, we're just trying to provide the widest array of interactions with other scholars. Um, and then for, for software developers, just as we have an API or an application prog programming interface, which is the technology that allows others to build on top of the Zotero software, and then in this case, the Zotero server, we've got, we've got that available. So people can create new things. Um, this is already happening, actually, quite a bit, um, just on the, the Zotero client, the software that you install in Firefox. Um, one of our most popular plugins, and these are all created by other people, is called Vertoff. So if you do film history, um, or film studies, Vertoff is really great because you can um, annotate uh, film right in, within the web browser. So you can save films into Zotero and then play them back in Vertoff and mark them up. Um, and so it's a really great resource. And that's just a plug-in to our plug-in to Firefox. Um, we've got over a dozen of these now, and people are writing these for various needs, again, that we didn't foresee or that are domain-specific. 
So a generalized tool that takes domain-specific material. We've, we have partnered with the Internet Archive. And one of the possibilities of social computing is to aggregate resources. So um, we, th we think there's a tremendous potential to, uh, you know, I know in my filing cabinet, I have materials that I scan that are in the public domain from the, the Victorian era that I have no way of sharing with anyone. I mean, I guess I could put them up at dancohen.org, but who's going to go there? So we can aggregate this through the Internet Archive. We have a nice quid pro quo <laughs> going on this that if you scan in, um, a public domain document. Uh, Internet Archive will do free optical character recognition, very high quality optical character recognition um, for you and send you back the full text of that. So we're hoping to really push for even institutions to join in this effort by donating things to this commons. There's interesting possibilities in social computing for annotation. Um, you know, again, what uh, a sort of basic process of, of scholarship where we go by and mark through here. But once we put this up on Internet Archive server, you can imagine two or more or a whole class annotating one document, because no longer is it just living on your machine. Um, I just talked about the, the commons. So we'll have a new icon where you can just drop in materials. And then, of course, going back to, to where I began, there's possibilities, I think tremendous possibilities, both within uh, the Internet Archive co uh, partnership um, and in, in the act of creating plugins for analysis and digital scholarship. So if you think about the personal collection you've assessed, you've brought materials in um, in a streamlined fashion into your personal collection, and then you want to push those out to get analyzed. So there are tremendous, for instance, there's a terrific academic text mining project uh, also funded by the Mellon Foundation called CSER at um, University of Illinois. And we're going to be able to, you could grab a whole bunch of text and then push it out to Caesar. And Caesar will use their grid computing facilities to do very sophisticated textual analysis on whatever you send to it. So I think there's tremendous possibilities, again, for, for analysis. Um, you know, we already have very good search. But um, you can imagine new forms of search, discovery, document discovery. Uh, that could be enabled. We have a very active group of Zoterons who are interested in mapping. And so we have a group that's using an open mapping system called Open Layers. Um, here's a case where they've taken Democracy in, in America, the full text of Democracy in America by Tocqueville, and extracted place names and then beamed that up onto a map. Right, again, something that would have been very complicated but is enabled through this very simple system. Um, we've already integrated some tools. So here's a tool from. Uh, MIT um, called Timeline, um, which, as you might imagine, creates timelines. Um, and it was incredibly in easy to just integrate this into Zotero. So you can imagine a historian who goes through a bunch of archives, uh, gets a bunch of letters, and then wants to create a, a quick view of, uh, that, that orders all that material. You can go ahead and do that. When you click on these icons, it opens up the, the actual object for you to do close reading on. Um, and I mentioned Vertoff, so here's Vertoff in action, where you can say, we have a translator for YouTube, actually. You can grab video from YouTube. And we have classes at, at Mason that do this. And grab, um, for instance, uh, there's a lot of interesting video from the fall of the Berlin Wall. And I have a colleague who's used some of those um, short videos that are on YouTube. Students can save them, mark them up, hand them in um, to a professor. So I think that's a tremendous possibility. You know, so basically, we want to get back to this. I mean, what we're trying to do in Zotero is far beyond questions of bibliography, correct formatting in the Chicago Manual of Style. Those are less interesting problems to me. What we want to get to is to enable anyone to do this. Because my feeling is we're just at the beginning of this phase of thinking about these new methods and, and how we're going to apply technology in a sensible fashion. And we need more people to be doing these kinds of, of experiments. because. We, Unless we do that, unless we enable that through new tools and, and new theories, um, I don't think we're going to get to where we need to be in five or 10 years. I think I'd better stop there and open the floor to questions. And thanks for your, your uh, Yes, Anne. I have a question that, um, that I've been sort of thinking about um, that was triggered by your point about personal collections, because I definitely have that for the book that I did. And, and I've been wondering what to do with these boxes in my attic. Um, 
But I was also thinking about the issue of if you scan just the document, right? So I did, I did a book on the history of garden design. But what was also interesting to me sometimes were the things that were next to. So like I was often looking at advertisements in the back of oh, the periodical right. in which an article appeared to try and help me gauge a sense of the class, the readership. And right. so I'm wondering about that kind of context that sits around both the primary and secondary document, that once you scan only yeah. that document, yeah. you've lost that. Boy, that, that's a terrific point. Um, this, is, this is precisely the great fear, and I think the resistance to a lot of um, movement in digital librarianship and the creation of digital libraries that historians present. So um, uh, when I was down at the Southern Historical Collection talking to not only the librarians there, who are going to work on this digital, uh, this digitization project, but also they brought in a bunch of scholars. And as we sat around in this workshop, the scholars said precisely that. They said, well, wait a second. My first book was based on one word that I saw in, you know, on the back of this letter. Um, uh, a scholar who wrote basically an entire book because they saw that um, there was this woman who owned a horse in the 1840s. And that, and that was an incredible insight about ownership and gender and these sorts of things. And so she worried that in the act of, of digitizing that document, you know, that, that thing that was over here would be lost. And I think that's a tremendous problem. And, and that's where I think things like user interface design, which we often don't think about, become really critical. I mean, one of the knocks against Google Books is that there's a, there's a sameness about it. I mean, even just thinking about people who do the history of the book, mm -hmm. everything is same-sized in Google Books and a lot of other projects. You don't get a lot of the material, even things like binding that isn't digitized as part of the process. And so, um, you know, and unfortunately, it's hard to go back once you've done it. Mm -hmm. And so I think a lot of the thought has to get done up front um, about how something is going to get used. The problem, though, is that you're often not sure how something is going to get used ahead of time. right? Like That's an incredibly creative use of the document. And, and some people might not think about it, uh, about doing it in that way. And so how do you prepare that? And there are lots of cases like this. Um, I have a friend who wrote a, a book that was based upon a box of, uh, that shouldn't have been kept in an archive, because it was about rumors in World War II. And based on all archival principles, this was not an important national record. This should have been tossed. For some reason, it was kept. It's sort of a found object. But now people are really interested in rumors and hearsay. right? And so I think there's always been this problem of the archivist being presumptu you know, presumptuous about the use of an object or the prioritization of an object. And that's why I feel we're in a stage right now where the scholars, I think it's much to UNC Chapel Hill's credit, mm -hmm. to have the scholars talking about their use patterns with the people who are going to be doing the digitization. Yes? Um, I'm just, I really like, uh, thank you for this presentation. Um, I think I'm a convert. convert. <laughs> um, my, my, my concern is this. I love this if it is in addition mm. to. Right. And not instead of. Right. Yeah. And my fear comes from the instead of. Um, that I love to just do all that stuff, but also be able to go to the collection <clears throat> and do what Anne just mm -hmm. described. Or look at stuff from another region of the world, but that doesn't mean now you don't have to go anymore to South America. You can right. think about South America without ever putting your feet down there. That's my fear. I love it in addition right. to not instead of. And how? what do you think about that? Uh, I completely agree. Um, <laughs> thank you. Um, I need to add that to my talk. You know, I mean, look. You know, I mean, this is the, the, the question with text mining. You know, when I look at that, and then you know, you see articles that try to do text mining on one poem. Well, last time I checked, the best way to analyze one poem is to actually read it and do what <laughs> literary scholars have done for generations, which is to tease out. So you know, now to deal with all Victorian novels. And to look at, let's say, patterns of gender relations in all Victorian novels, OK, now we're looking at a problem. Um, so you know, but I think the line has to be drawn at, at, some, at, at some fashion. I, that's why I'm very attracted to interfaces that allow for browsing, prospecting, but also quick, deep views, right? So that Brigham Young site that allows you to, to, to 
get your bell curve, but then to zoom in and look at a particular item much more closely and to say, oh, wait a second, that, that was because of this. Um, you know, it helps you, I, I think if you just stay at the level of patterns and at the, the bird's eye view, I think you're gonna be in trouble. So, um, but the line is not so easy to draw. And I think the problem with digital humanities up to this point is, and it's been around a lot longer than I've been doing it, but I think the reason it, it didn't take off in you know, the 70s, 80s, and 90s is that I think it, was too, it probably was too enthusiastic in a sense. You know, Roy always had this great line about, you know, professionalization happens when criticism, self-criticism happens. And people say, you know what, no, that's not a good use of technology. So I have a very pragmatic view. I think when people invite me to give talks like this, they think I'm gonna you know, dance around with all kinds of bells and whistles. And my feeling is, and maybe it's just because I've had a traditional training uh, in history, is that historians still do a lot of things right and, and well. And that can't, that can't be taken over through digital methods. Yes? When you rely on a crowd, um, have a variety of difficulties, including sampling errors and, and crowd bias and, yeah. and those kinds of things. I wonder if you could comment on those. And right. Avoid them. Um, yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a very good question as well. Um, uh, you know, I, we, at least in the many digital projects that we've done at the center, where we've relied on, on, on the crowd, What's that? Providence yeah, Providence. Well, I was going to relate it directly to that because usually when I, you know, when I gave a talk, for instance, at um, in front of a bunch of archivists about the 9/11 collection, you know, instantly worried hands went up and said, you know, how do you, these people submitted this stuff across the web? How do you deal with provenance? How do you, you know? How do you deal if, you know? And, and indeed, at, in that that project, um, I don't know why I'm singling out this state. But we had the proverbial teenager from New Jersey um, that, that we worried about in the 9-11 project, about the mischievous teenager from New Jersey. Again, nothing against New Jersey. Um, <laughs> but but um, that was a concern. And, and, and yet we've done a lot of these collecting projects. We did one on, on, uh, on uh, Hurricane Katrina, um, where we got about 30,000 photos and, and stories. And, First of all, my, my feeling of actually the, the, just the practical experience of doing these projects is that there's a lot less um, uh, m you know, mischievous activity than you'd imagine. Um, that, that's the first thing that I would say, is that uh, it became somewhat of a red herring. I mean, we vetted all the stories and the photographs, and we really worried about these sorts of things. And I would say it's a you know, tiny you know, fraction. Had, had problems with it. That's the, the first thing I would say on that, and indeed any crowdsourcing project. And that's just because the teenager from New Jersey has better things to do. <laughs> you know, I mean, there's, they can steal music. You know, they can get the latest Batman movie online. Messing with, you know, historians seems like a relatively uninteresting way to spend the afternoon. So, um, so that's the first thing I would say. Um, but you don't realize that until you actually do a project like this. That that. You know, unless someone's really out to get you, it happens a lot less than you'd imagine. Um, and indeed, I think that's one of the hidden secrets behind Wikipedia, too. There's a lot less vandalism than, than you'd imagine. Um, but, but the second thing, and then I would also say there, there are technical ways to adjust for that, and that depends on the project. So for instance, for the 9-11 project, um, we took the very expansive view of saving everything. Early on, people were saying, well, don't you want to just save the best stories or the richest stories? Or maybe you should only save the stories from New York and Washington. And we thought, well, wait a second. Maybe someone will want to do a kind of history based on something else. So we took everything, literally everything that came in, we've saved. Some of it is in what we call a dark archive that we don't put on the website for various reasons. Um, but what we did in that process is we did use some technological methods to do verification. So for instance, when someone submitted something, we sent them a verification email loop. So we said, thank you for submitting. Um, you know, here's a copy. Here's a record for you. Um, and um, and if, we got a, if we didn't get a feedback loop on that, then we could enter a bit in the database that, said, that eventually would tell the Library of Congress when we sent the thing that says, we can't vouch for this. This email address was, you know, uh, was returned as unaddressable. Um, you know, and so we can add metadata to an object without deleting it to say, we don't think that this person was actually Colin Powell. 
Um, now, now the, the other thing I would say, and I think it relates directly to the prior question, is that um, for some reason, people feel when they look at digital things that somehow you have to check your brain at the door. And, and my feeling is, as historians, we've always dealt with bad crowdsourcing. I mean, there are, a lot, there are many lies in things that I've read in Victorian archives, right? There are falsehoods. There are misremembrances. So that's sort of always been something that we've dealt with. And my feeling is, as a scholar, we're supposed to go in with a skeptical eye. And just because it's online, you know, in fact, we should be more skeptical. So I think there's a variety of kind of attitudes you can take to it, technological methods. But then I also think the problems haven't been as severe as we'd expect. Um, you know, I think for every project it differs. And I'm, I'm interested to see when we do an aggregation on the Zotero server, what kind of biases come, come out of that. And, um, but that's also where I think there might be some methods to say, um, you know, for instance, we could work with the American Historical Association to tag certain people as a member of the American Historical Association, do some verification loop on that, and then to just build a search based on those. Now, my feeling is, you know, there's something kind of elitist <laughs> about that. And there are amateur historians and journalists and all kinds of people using Zotero that'll probably do as good a job creating bibliographies and things as professional historians and that we should probably take it all. And that if you have enough scale, statistically those things kind of you know, get worked out. Yes? Um, what kind of possibilities do you think for you know, like the future of Zotero? Um, right, so we're, we're still worrying about doing this, this you know, server rollout. Um, I think there are tremendous interesting possibilities there. Um, and I think you probably saw some of the areas that we're going to go into. So we're really interested in overlaying analytical tools on top of it. Um, everything from mapping to text mining um, to um, uh, domain-specific services. So for instance, uh, we were talking over lunch, uh, someone who does music history, for instance, we might want to have a very specific plugin for the music historian that does, um, you know, that handles sheet music, for instance. There's all kinds of metadata, for instance, that's not, that we don't capture presently, um, that we would need to do something like music history. Um, we'd like to do things with a lot more with non-textual things, so uh, highly complex and heterogeneous objects like artwork, modern art, digital art. Um, there are all kinds of things that we'd want to use. Um, then there's a variety of um, I guess, librarian interest in the tool. So we're working with institutional repository software builders like DSpace and Fedora. I don't know if you've heard of these projects. But to use Otero as a kind of front end to capture um, professors' research and back it up and save it, which is a big movement right now, is to create institutional repositories. That stuff isn't often caught. And so um, there's a lot of initiatives on that front. And I'm really interested in the kind of possibilities on that front. So, you know, I think, again, we've, we've you know, in many ways, this is a many-headed beast. And it's, you know, trying to, to direct it is, is difficult. And we have a lot of stakeholders now in the project. Um, but, you know, it's tremendously exciting as we move beyond the simple, you know, formatting of bibliographies, which, you know, at the end of the day, it's, a, it, it's nice, but it doesn't do something more. I think as part of writing this book, I'm also going to work on um, some add-ons to it that you know that kind of show the potential uh, for digital scholarship. Yeah. Uh, I think you mentioned Dan being green with envy about mm -hmm. this sort of thing. It's just it's marvelous stuff. And I wonder if you are getting any sort of uh, pressure from if, because the therapy grabs so many different kinds of things off the web and off the bibliographic website and things, things like that. Are you running into any sort of uh, issues of proprietary sort of uh, copyright kind of thing with other companies, or perhaps some of these other bibliographic citation right. software packages that sort of are probably looking at this and saying, wow, why didn't we do this? Or, Right. Um, yeah. Um, so you know, I won't discuss that we're being sued by a large multinational corporation <laughs> um, who who owns the market leader um, bibliographic reference system, um, and and is unhappy with us hurting their market. Um, but um, but just uh, you know, beyond that, I think um, uh, you know, in terms of copyright, I mean, you know, we respect all these things. You know, you can't. So Terra works with a lot of gated resources, but it doesn't get you through the gate. You still have to be on campus and 
and have a login and all those things. When you go through and get to JSTOR, then you can save those things. There's been a lot of concern expressed about the server being a possibility for copyright infringement. People could use the server to exchange information. We're going to have a variety of hurdles to, to do that. I mean, my, the first thing I would say, and it kind of is similar to what I say about crowdsourcing, and not to be glib about it, but you know, if you want to send a file to someone illegally, there are much easier ways to do it than through you know, Zotero server, where we know who you are and have your IP address and uh, can notify the authorities. So I mean, that's one thing that I would say. Um, we are in our project with the Internet Archive. We're operating under the DMCA, Digital Millennium Copyright Act, which has a safe harbor provision, which the IA already employs, which means that as long as you take stuff down when people ask you to, that you're protected. So if for some reason someone puts in, let's say, digitizes a book from after 1923 that's still in copyright, sticks it in there, um, it can be taken down. And my feeling is it's easy to put stuff online. It's e easy to take it down. Roy and I wrote a, I think, a really helpful uh, chapter in our book on digital history on copyright that I would encourage people to read um, uh, on this. And uh, so, um, so yeah, so I mean, we're aware of that. But I think we're also going to take other methods like um, uh, metadata is, I mean, you can't patent or copyright metadata. Um, so um, uh, I mean, obviously, you can copyright and you can create access barriers to, for instance, databases of, of metadata. Um, you know, my feeling is also we should push back a little bit on fair use and these sorts of things in that you know, these companies that are providing electronic services for scholars should understand when a scholar wants to pass a reference to someone else and shouldn't, um, shouldn't be that concerned. And indeed, um, but, uh, you know, but we're also taking other methods like um, bring your own storage for private use. So um, if you're running the latest version of Zotero, Zotero 1.5, that has file storage, um, uh, there's a, a part of the preference pane that says, I want to sync my files to Case Western rather than to George Mason, we probably will actually require people to bring storage for cases where, you know, that, that could be rife for abuse, where someone would set up a group and, you know, they're sharing bit-torrented movies or something like that. Mm -hmm. Again, I don't think it's a great tool to do that with it, but we'll we'll have methods so that people can bring their own storage. If I could ask just a quick yeah. follow-up. Yeah. One of the concerns, and I'm a big fan of Zotero, I've promoted it to a lot of people. Um, one of the concerns I do get from people is, well, if I've used some other kind of service, and this is always the problem when you invest all this time and energy in a subscription service, and they really have the power over the information you store, right. say, over several years, there are ways of getting that information into Sotero and that. Mm -hmm. But what the concern is, is what is the future of Sotero? If I invest five, six, seven, ten years right. yeah. in building collections, is there going to be the tech support and the service support right. there, or is it just going to go away at some point because maybe it does? Right. Well, that's a great question. Um, so first on the commercial providers thing, I mean, first of all, as a scholar, I, my, my feeling is I own my research. You know? And frankly, when you look at terms of services for various things, um, if I was a scholar, I'd rather my stuff be in my whole, you know, if RefWorks crashes um, or goes out of business tomorrow, and, and people often think, like, for some reason, commercial interests are, have the longevity of the Library of Congress, you know, which doesn't make sense to me either. Um, you know, look, this is a project that has enormous backing. Um, but not only that, you have your stuff. And you have your stuff in a format. One of the things that we like to do is we provide as many ways to get your stuff out of Zotero as you can to get it in. And we encourage all other commercial entities and other projects to do the same thing. It should be as easy to go from Zotero as it is to come. So we have a variety of ways of just exporting. I mean, if you want to go to EndNote, that's great. We provide the way. We didn't have to. We're just nice. And we provide export to that. We provide export into open formats. And that's the other thing I want to say is that Zotero is all based upon international standards that I think have longevity as well. So we're storing things in, in ways that um, you know, isn't in, for instance, a proprietary binary format, as your research is when it's an EndNote. Um, and I think that's really important. So you can, you know, if you're technically sophisticated, you can go into the guts of Zotero and use your stuff in any way you want. So, um, you know, having said that, I think Zotero is going to be around for a long time. And we have huge investment. We have huge 
I mean, we have financial investment, but I think more importantly, we have community investment in the tool. We have over 100 universities that are currently recommending it, actively recommending it. Um, that number goes up every week. And so when we have this kind of level of buy-in, that means that we can continue to innovate on it and so forth, even after our initial funding runs out. Maybe what we'll do, because I know classes start in 10 minutes, and I don't want to have a sort of mass exodus. So I'll, um, I'll, I'll draw to a close on this okay. note of longevity. But I'm sure there's many of you. I, know, I saw a couple of hands that didn't, ask, didn't get to ask questions. So yeah, um, if, if Dan can stay for a little bit before we have to whisk him off to the library, that would be great. And I'll just invite people to ask your questions one-on-one. -on -one. We still have cookies and things. And those of you who have to get to a 2 o'clock class can still make it on the run. So thank you very much. Oh, thank you.